dealing with our doubt. We're going to have our first song this morning with our online family, but we're going to continue in worship for those that are here in the service, singing Amazing Grace by Chains of God. going to lead us in our next song. Be still for the presence of the Lord while we're waited upon for our tithes and offerings this morning.
The scripture reading this morning is taken from Matthew 28, verses 1 to 6. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, and an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He was risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading this morning. Morning, everyone. I, I, the question I want to ask this morning, when we, as we start our new series on doubting God, anyone ever done it? Oh, well, maybe we can go straight to morning tea, right? We can all get RPL, recognise prior learning, for going through this process of doubting God. Anyone ever heard a story so incredulous that there's like. If I wasn't there, I wouldn't believe it happened. Yeah? Anyone ever thought of a time where they went and someone retold them a story and believe me, it's true. Imagine being those women on the first morning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, who's probably not as important because she didn't get a second name. Magdalene's not her second name either. It's where she's from. But they go back and they tell the people who saw Jesus die on the cross, newsflash, he's alive. Now, if you were told that someone was alive who you saw had died, would you believe it? Probably not. Because with your own eyes... You saw him die, so there's no way, after, as the s- cycle of life goes that we talk about, once you're dead, you're really, really, really dead, right? And yet here they are, retelling a story, and what did everyone do straight away? Believed. No. Not what happened at all. But this morning we're going to look at the, this story of the resurrection and how it's central to our faith. Central to our faith. It's the cornerstone, really. It's the crowning proof that Jesus defeated death. Nothing in all of creation can separate us from the love of Jesus. Not even death. Scripture records for us that there were some appearances of Jesus after he was raised from the dead. Does anyone know how many? Well, I've already done the homework. It's 13. 13 post-resurrection appearances before he ascends to heaven. Before he's taken up into the cloud, and I'm not sure it's really now you see me, now you don't, like a wiggling of the nose that we used to see on the Bewitch show, remember years ago? Nothing like that. But there was a going up into the cloud as, as recorded as part of the ascension. Right before the, this passage, right at the end of this chapter rather, is a really famous passage that we, re, we recall is the great omission, right? It's a thing that no one ever does as much as they probably should. Most people call it the Great Commission, you know, go out into all the world and make disciples of all nations. We do it at some, but do we do it as much as we possibly should? I don't know. I'm with in the don't do it as much as I probably should, category. But right before the Great Commission, we read these words in verses 16 and 17. Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him. And here is the 
comforting thought. And some doubted. Some doubted. These are people who had spent time with him and yet they still found themselves doubting. It's okay to doubt. It's what we do with the doubt that is the key point this morning. You see, I don't think that it's possible to have faith at all if you haven't had doubt. You actually need doubt to then have faith come from that. Even when each of us have had our mountaintop experiences with with regards to our faith, have we ever been living a life that's absent of all doubt? Even when God is so close, so present, so real, there are times where we wonder... What's happening? I wonder what's happening here. There's still questions we can't answer. There's still situations that seem so unfair. There's still hurts that I cannot resolve. So full of faith and yet not so sure about what is happening in the world around us. We watch on, we watch on TV with wonder and confusion at times as to what is happening in the world around us. One of the most scary things to do is to voice our doubts sometimes because the next person goes, what do you mean you doubt? Of course you can't doubt, just believe. I think that one of the safest places that we should be able to share our doubts and our concerns is within the church and yet we so often are quick, we, me included, are so often quick to uh, say flashy church terms to try to help somebody feel encouraged. It's okay. God still loves you. That doesn't stop the doubt. I think it would be super helpful at times when people are struggling to sit with them and not try to have the answers but journey with them. It's hard sometimes to wonder what God is doing when um, we watch things, as I said before, on, on TV and the news particularly and you just shake your head at times. Some of the other reasons that we doubt are because the things that we were taught as children aren't part of our reality as adults because there are... We believe that Jesus loves us, this I know, for the Bible tells us so. But we don't actually remember that when we've got pressure of the adult life on us. How about some of the verses in the Bible that seem to contradict each other? What? How can that be? That can create a seed of doubt. What about interacting with people that say they're Christians and they hurt us? Can that create doubt? What about when a spiritual leader falls or fails? Does that create doubt? When bad things happen... Does that create doubt? Your doubts and mine 
when handled properly, can be the catalyst for a stronger faith. You see, our faith is not a destination, somewhere where that we at, something that we attain or something that we can purchase off the shelf, but rather our faith is a journey, not a destination. And being within a faith community should be the safest place for us to ask the tough questions. Who was the first to believe that Jesus was the Son of God? It would have had to have been those disciples, wasn't it? Who followed Jesus? No, if you look in Scripture, the first person to believe that Jesus was the Son of God was the demons. Legion was the first one to, to pronounce that Jesus was the Son of God. Does that mean that they have belief in him? Sure, they wouldn't have faith in him though. They believed who he was. You believe that there is only one, good, one God, that's good, James tells us. Even the demons believe that and they shudder. The demons believe that, believe that Jesus was the Son of God, but they didn't have faith. It's possible to have good theology, that is, good thinking or good words to wrap around a faith language that wraps around who God is. That's right beliefs, but that's not faith. You see, it is by grace, Paul tells, or the writer tells the church in Ephesus, it's by grace that we've been saved through faith. Not for ourselves, it is a gift from God. You don't get grace because of right beliefs. Because you believe the same thing as everybody else, that that means that's why you get grace. No, you get grace as a free gift from God, irrespective of what you believe. So even if you are a supporter who doesn't support the right football team, God still loves you somehow. And that's okay. The strongest faith isn't a faith that never doubts. The strongest faith is a faith that grows through the doubts. One of the 12 disciples is a guy named Thomas. Now, he gets a fairly bad rap. Who degree? He's a guy called, what do they refer to him as? Doubting Thomas. Or well, Didymus is another re reference to him. Now, in John's Gospel, in chapter 20, there's a reference in there to Thomas saying these words after he's been told, we've seen the Lord from the others. Hang on a minute. Where's this paraphrase? Hang on a minute. There is no way in the world I'm believing anything you've got to say until I see him for myself, until I can put my fingers in his hands and my hand in his side, no way. Not believing it. I saw it with my own two eyes. I'm not going to do it. The reason why Thomas is referred to as doubting is because he hasn't seen Jesus yet. The others have. And yet, uh, in, at the end of Matthew chapter 28, verse 16 and 17, we read in there that they saw him and still doubted. So why aren't they called the doubting disciples? Maybe because Thomas already had that job taken up. I think it's a, it's a bit of a bad rap. The reality is, for me, Thomas is a bit of a realist. He's a thinker. He needs to, he needs to be able to see things within his own life. He needs to think through things. He's got questions. Do questions make him bad? Does that mean that doubts make him a bad person? Does that make him a second class Jesus follower? I think throughout time he seems to have got that rap. But he's not. Thinkers are not People that need to think things through are not bad. 
when it says in verse 25 that we have seen the Lord, in the original text in the Greek, it's actually with an active voice that it's recorded. And so they don't just say it once, but it's one of those things that's said over and over and over again. We have seen the Lord... And then he goes on to say what he said. Doubt is not, Oswald Chambers tells us, that doubt is not always a sign that a man is wrong. It may be just a sign that he's thinking. He's thinking things through. If you want to rank the disciples in order of strength, you probably would put Thomas at the top. You'd put him at the top because if you look at John chapter 11, you see the story in there where he's recorded again. And Jesus told them plainly that Lazarus is dead. Let us go to him. And Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let's also go so that we might die with him. In John chapter 14, Jesus said, "Go, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And Thomas says, hang on a minute, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Thomas wanted to know for himself. What did Thomas say? I need to know where you're going. And Jesus then uttered those famous words that we've heard many times before. I am the way, the truth and the life. At the end of John chapter 20, eight days later, the disciples were together again. And at this time, Thomas was with them. Eight days. Even when he doubted, Thomas showed up again and again and again. Even when we doubt, it's important that we keep showing up. The doors were locked, but suddenly as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hands into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. Thomas then exclaimed, my Lord and my God. Jesus came to Thomas when he was doubting and he gave him what he needed. One moment he was doubting. The next moment, through the encounter with Jesus, he went from doubting to shouting because he was telling everybody that could hear hear him that here is my Lord and my God. When you're doubting, who feels all alone? Who feels isolated? Who feels like there's a greater level of disconnection when you're doubting? And I must be a pretty rubbish Christian if I'm doubting my faith. Oh, just me? We feel all alone, but you need to remember that God is not distant in our doubts. Jesus is not a standoff saviour who is out there like a a, a cosmic saviour who moves us around on a chessboard. But he comes and is willing to be touched and is reaching out to touch us as well. There are times when we're in the midst of our doubting seasons where... We feel where Jesus feels far off. We need to be reaching out to Him just in the same way that He's reaching out for us. It's okay to wrestle, it's okay to struggle, it's okay to doubt. I think some of the greatest doubters in the world have often become the strongest believers. The enemy will come to try to steal, kill and destroy. He'll try to use our doubt to drive us away from God. But God will use our doubt to draw us close to him. Thomas and the other disciples in Matthew chapter 28 
went and stood on a mountain. Thomas preached faithfully. He preached about Jesus faithfully after he first went from doubting to shouting. He then went on and so records show he died through martyrdom in India in 72 AD, just the other day. You see, your doubts, and thanks be to God, my doubts, don't disqualify us from our faith. We may not have all the answers, and sometimes I think we leave the telling others about Jesus to someone else because we might still have a few doubts for ourselves. Faith isn't about an absence of doubt. Faith is about, in, whilst we have the presence of doubt, we push through and still see Jesus on the other side. Psalm chapter 23 is a famous psalm that we've read many times. And it says, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. You are with me. The, the valley is not a shadow of, it's not a journey to, like a destination, but it is a journey through. Don't let doubt be our dead end, but rather allow doubt to be the thing that allows us to have within us a faith that grows. Oh, um, have been reading a book recently called Faith After Doubt uh, by an um, author called Brian McLaren. If you, um, I can give that to you later if you like. But he says in one of the chapters that we, the road is only ever made by walking. <coughs> have you ever been in a paddock that's never had anybody walk through it for a fair while and it's all overgrown? The first time you walk through it is the new thoroughfare, right? Sometimes we have to walk through the weeds and, of, and the doubts knowing that faith is a journey and keep trudging through because eventually we will get there. But my faith's not that great. I'm doubting like mad. Sure. When, we're, when we doubt, the encouragement is to come to Jesus. When we're struggling, we can do it by ourselves, right? No. When we're struggling, come to Jesus. When we have a a sense of uncertainty within us, come to Jesus. When we've got questions, come to Jesus. When we are hurt by people inside and outside the church, come to Jesus. Each and every day, join with Mary Magdalene and the other Mary and celebrate that he is not dead, but he is risen. He has the power over sin and death and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, the cornerstone of our faith, the crowning proof that Jesus has the power over death. Nothing in all creation can separate us and yet we sometimes doubt that for ourselves. So I'm inviting you over these next few weeks to come on a journey. Because faith is a journey, not a destination. The music team's going to come and share with us in just a moment. And they're sharing with us a song that says, Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Ten minutes a day, I need you. Or is it every hour? Right? We often think, if I just get my 10 minutes in, then that'll be enough. But 
Scripture tells us to pray consistently, pray without ceasing. Romans chapter 12 tells us that we need to take every part of our being and offer it as a living sacrifice. So we cannot sing this song where it says, every hour I need you if we're just gazetting 10 10 minutes a day to Jesus. But every fibre of our being, every conversation that we have, every thought that we have, allow it to be captured by Him so that we can serve Him faithfully with our lives and reflect Him and His love faithfully to all that we meet. Loving God, in our humanness and brokenness, we acknowledge that there are times when we doubt. In the midst of that doubt, may your gift of grace still be ours and allow it to grow our faith, we pray. And Lord, we pray these things in your name. Amen. The announcements this morning are that uh, two, two or three, 
three Sundays time maybe. Three Sundays time there's an um, afternoon at Bundamba Salvos um, and Cold Street in Bundamba um, with the Melbourne Staff Band coming up from Melbourne. If you want to go to that, I have a QR code here. You can book your ticket. It's free, but you still need a ticket to go. Uh, this Wednesday night, the family store is open for late night shopping from 5 p.m. If you want to head along to that. Uh, light Up Cow Bar is coming on the 3rd of December. If you want to head to the late night shopping event, uh, give Donna a call at the shop and just let her know you're wanting to come. Uh, so light up cow bars the 3rd of, uh, of uh, December. Let's hope that that's not a date claimer for a massive storm that just nearly wiped out cow bar. Remember that? Who forgot that last year? Uh, and then the 11th is our um, cow bar community carols, which will be down at the school, at cow bar state school. Also, Elsa's got an announcement about SAES training for those that want to do that. I'm here for supper. So anyone that wants to be part of the team that does catering in, in disaster events, then uh, please see Elsa. Uh, it's not that you have to be there every single day that the uh, event is on but you might be able to volunteer for a shift and for, to be able to do that, just need to be able to do the f food safe course that she's referring to. So 22nd of November here at the church, we'll have it up on the screen and then um, Adam can sponsor morning tea, ah, supper, that's not true. Hi Adam. <laughs> uh, all right, we're going to have our final song, Lord I Lift Your Name on High, before we go and have morning tea together. Oh, Jeanette, are you on morning tea? Ooh! <laughs> Delicious. Coconut cookies all around. <laughs> Let's be upstanding. Let's sing this final song together. your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show.
Amen. Please be in prayer for our country. There are already homeless and displaced people across the country because their houses have been washed away. So this isn't a new situation for Australia. It seems to be the pattern now. So please keep the situation in your prayers. If, you, if we do end up being deployed and you can't make it for whatever reason, please don't feel any amount of guilt about that. This is how life goes sometimes. But if you are available, you'll be more than welcome to um, assist in any deployment we are actually able to get to if we aren't flooded in ourselves. So let's be mindful of what is going on in our current situation. Let's um, have our benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. And as you go out into this week, may he go before you and beyond you. And may you step in the footsteps that he has planned for you. Go in peace. Amen.